Thank you everyone for joining us, taking time out of your day today. Uh, so as you can see here, the title is Bloating and Distension, Myths, Misconceptions, and the Microbiome. So we're really gonna dive in deep here today into this topic, and it's uh, actually really an interesting topic. I've been looking forward to this presentation for a while because there's uh, so much new research coming out over the last few years that I think are really changing how we view uh, these particular symptoms and conditions uh, and what can be done about them clinically. Uh, I know they can be a source of frustration for a lot of patients and practitioners uh, because a lot of the treatments that we have aren't always effective or they might just be temporarily effective. So some of these new research insights I think are uh, kind of leading the way towards better treatment and better testing options. Uh, so let's go ahead and dive in. Along the way, also we're gonna address uh, some of the common myths and misconceptions. So we'll get to that as well. Uh, so this is just kind of a brief overview of what we're gonna cover today. Uh, particularly just focusing on clinical challenges and some of the reasons behind that. Uh, so we know that bloating and distension are both very common, uh, particularly bloating. Uh, there's about a 30% prevalence, according to many epidemiological surveys. Uh, and we certainly know that they can cause significant distress for a lot of patients. Uh, and they're very common to a lot of conditions, which you'll actually see momentarily. Um, <clears throat> and so that can pose a lot of challenges in terms of diagnosis and treatment, given that there are so many different conditions where these uh, symptoms can be related. And then we're gonna dive in again, as I said, to some of the most common myths, misconceptions, uh, in terms of what typically causes or uh, is attributed in terms of bloating and distension. So I think there's some surprising uh, information out there that's actually been in the research for a while, uh, but has not necessarily gotten translated effectively to clinical practice as much. And then we're really gonna kind of focus in on, especially the role of the microbiome and what this uh, newer research is uh, yielding in terms of new insights into which microbes, which types of imbalances, other aspects of gut health that tie into the microbiome and how those together uh, can increase the chances for bloating and distension. Uh, this is a great recent review article. Uh, I just wanted to highlight one of the quotes here and so the quote is, abdominal bloating and distension are two of the most commonly reported GI symptoms. Uh, and this is according to a U.S. household survey. Uh, we're recording that one. They estimated the prevalence of bloating to be in the range of 16 to 31%, and that's sort of in the general adult population. So uh, definitely a very common, very prevalent uh, set of uh, symptoms or conditions. They also go on to say that in particular, uh, IBS, there's a high prevalence of bloating, as much as 66 to 90 percent, depending on uh, different surveys. So it's a very high prevalence of patients with irritable bowel syndrome and other conditions that fall under that general category of functional gastrointestinal conditions, uh, where the, uh, bloating is also one of the common symptoms. So this is a table uh, pertaining to the differential diagnosis of bloating and distension from a recent review published in the American Journal of Gastroenterology. You can see that uh, reference here at the top here, but I'm gonna highlight some of the information in this table. Uh, so we certainly know uh, from all the different studies that are out there that there can be non-gastrointestinal uh, factors and conditions that are related to bloating and distension. Uh, certainly food is one of the common triggers, different types of foods such as FODMAPs, for example, um, and even Food antigens in some patients are thought to trigger bloating. We'll get to some of that information a little bit later. Uh, medications, uh, various non-gastrointestinal conditions like obesity, hyperthyroidism, uh, PMS, um, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is another one where this is a common set of symptoms, uh, et cetera. So uh, definitely something to think about there that there can be kind of a systemic context uh, for these uh, symptoms. Uh, but also when we're looking at the gastrointestinal tract, uh, we know there are a lot of different scenarios there as well, uh, including SIBO, uh, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, carbohydrate uh, malabsorption, especially intolerance, celiac disease, pancreatic insufficiency. Uh, we do often see with GI MAP that patients that have these common symptoms often have deficient levels, and we'll see that as well. Uh, various conditions affecting the stomach, including gastroparesis. Uh, that's one of the uh, common symptoms in gastroparesis is bloating. Um, there's also a number of other conditions here you can see. And then down at the bottom of this main column, just note that certain infections, of course, also can produce symptoms of bloating and distension, particularly H. pylori infection, uh, and also certain parasites like Giardia. 
Then the next category we have is, that's traditionally referred to as functional gastrointestinal conditions. Uh, it's been recently renamed to disorders of gut-brain interaction, which is the DGBI. And that's to reflect this strong connection in these types of disorders between the gut and the nervous system. And in that category, we have IBS. Uh, so that's certainly one of the best known conditions that's often associated with bloating and distension. As we saw earlier, that's a very common symptom uh, in that condition. And then there are various types of constipation, and also FD, which stands for functional dyspepsia. Um, that's a little less well recognized, uh, despite the fact that it's actually a pretty common uh, functional GI condition, second only to IBS. And bloating and distension are quite common in functional dyspepsia as well. Uh, and something called aerophagia, we'll talk briefly about that later. And that's actually air swallowing, so that can lead to more upper GI type uh, bloating and distension, often related to more frequent belching. Um, and then just general functional bloating and distension without necessarily other symptoms. So as you can see, it's pretty challenging when patients present with these symptoms in terms of trying to triage uh, which of these factors may be relevant for a given patient. That's really where GI map comes into play. So it can help practitioners connect the dots in terms of possible contributors and even certain causes of bloating and constipation. So we'll highlight some of these here, and then we'll talk about some of them more in depth as we go through the webinar. So on the first page of GMAP, we have our pathogens. Uh, there's various bacterial pathogens. Commonly, they're causes of food poisoning, gastroenteritis. We also have parasitic pathogens. So we just talked briefly about Giardia. Uh, that's certainly one of the well-known causes in some patients for bloating and distension. Uh, viral pathogens, and then we also have H. pylori. So that's probably one of the most common um, opportunist microbial pathogens that we see on GM out, that when it's elevated, uh, that often is associated with symptoms of bloating and distension as well. And then under the commensal keystone bacteria section, you can see for this particular example, there's kind of a skew there towards the right for many of these microbes, especially at the phylum level. So the phylum level is near the bottom of the screen. That's the Bacteroidetes and the Firmicutes. That's kind of the big picture view of the microbiome. So together, those make up about 80 to 90% of the microbiome. You can see when you see those elevated, that's indicating that there is a higher concentration of bacteria particularly in the colon. So this commensal section here is uh, largely reflecting mostly colon type bacteria. Uh, but there are other individual species that are also relatively elevated. Uh, so we refer to this sort of as one of our top three dysbiosis patterns as the dysbiotic um, digestive dysfunction type pattern, um, also the overgrowth pattern. Um, so that certainly is one of the patterns that we often see in patients that have these common symptoms. We'll get into some of the details as to why that may be the case, uh, but just kind of give you a hint there. It's often related to reduced digestion and absorption, also for some patients, constipation. And then we have the opportunistic and overgrowth microbes. Uh, this is on page three of the GI map. Now you can see in this example, there's quite a few that are elevated. Uh, these are types of microbes that are often dominant more in the small intestine. Uh, they basically can also be found in the colon and person stool samples, uh, but where they tend to predominate for most patients tends to be more of that small intestinal uh, scenario. Um, and these types of microbes we often see elevated uh, in patients with these symptoms, but also in patients that are not digesting well. And there's actually quite a bit of research. We'll see one of the studies a little bit later. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. So this is the inflammatory and commensal inflammatory sections on GI map. Uh, you can see here that for this particular example, there are quite a few that are elevated. Uh, so these types of microbes we do commonly see elevated in patients with a pretty wide range of conditions. Many of them also do have uh, features of bloating and distension. Um, so we'll see a little bit later that some of these may be specifically involved in terms of the products that they produce, such as lipopolysaccharide, which is known to stimulate inflammation in the gut, and also histamine. So again, these are Good set of microbes to uh, make sure that you're checking when patients have bloating and distension because they can often be uh, contributors to those symptoms. All right, and then in the next section, we have an example here of a patient that has elevated candida. We'll also see some research related to that, but we know that candida is also one of the common 
uh, fungi of yeast that can overgrow in the gut uh, that may contribute to symptoms of loading and distension. In the next section, we have an uh, example of another parasite, blastocystis hominis. Uh, that's just yet another one that we often see in patients with these symptoms. Um, then let's look at the intestinal health marker section. So in this section, um, let me just go back to that one. So in this section, uh, you can certainly see in this example that elastase is reduced. Uh, it's well below that cutoff level of 200. And this is something we very commonly see in patients with these symptoms of bloating and distension is evidence of reduced digestion. So elastase is one of the key markers for pancreatic enzyme production. So when that's low, that's indicating that patients may have reduced levels overall, which may lead to an increase in undigested foods. Also, there's a lot of studies showing that low elastase can be one of the main contributors to dysbiosis. So that's one of the key markers to check, again, when patients have these common symptoms. Uh, Anti-gliadin IgA, that's telling us about potential gluten reactivity. So that's an uh, antibody uh, that reacts with the gliadin part of gluten. Um, and that can be elevated, again, in patients who have reactions to gluten. And again, that may be related to symptoms. We'll see an example of how that um, may be uh, causing or, or contributing to bloating uh, based on some of this new research here. Uh, there's also eosinophil activation protein, so that's another uh, marker for a certain type of immune uh, activation. So that's obviously produced by eosinophils. Eosinophils often interact with mast cells, and as we'll see, mast cells are strongly implicated in uh, the processes related to uh, particularly bloating. All right, so that's a little bit of the background on uh, bloating and distension. Let's go ahead and dive into some of these prevailing myths and misconceptions uh, that in particular have contributed to some of the lack of progress. We know a lot of patients that get treated for these conditions, for these symptoms, uh, these types of symptoms will often return. Um, so the treatment sometimes can be effective, but then, of course, there's a recurrence. So we want to understand a little bit more about what's going on based on the research here. So the first myth, misconception that I want to talk about uh, is simply uh, there's a lot of kind of confusion over the terms themselves. I think we all have a tendency to use them interchangeably, uh, but they're actually defined as distinct but related conditions and may have somewhat different underlying causes. So let's look a little bit more at that. Uh, in terms of uh, bloating and extension, this is a great review article from just a few years ago addressing some of these misconceptions and also some of the newer research that's helping to correct some of those misconceptions. And this is a quote from that review article. Uh, so basically, this, these are the definitions. So this is bloating has been defined as a feeling of increased abdominal pressure that may or may not be accompanied by objective abdominal distension, uh, i.e. visible enlargement of the waist. Conversely, the latter may occur without associated bloating sensation. So you can basically have one without the other. Uh, and they say, thus, bloating is a sensation, meaning a symptom, and distension is a sign, meaning that it's objectively measurable. Um, so there are two different things. So bloating, you can have the sensation uh, that your um, abdomen might be distended, but it's actually not in some cases. So um, certainly important to understand the distinctions there. Also, a little bit about the epide epidemiology. So we talked a little bit about bloating and distension being common in general, with bloating being the more common. Uh, but generally, studies are pretty consistent, showing that on average, roughly about half of patients with bloating tend to also have distension. So obviously, one can occur without the other. Well, this is a really common misconception based on the research. But I definitely want to dive in a little bit here. So this particular one is that bloating and distension are primarily caused by excess abdominal gas production, such as in SIBO. So it turns out there's quite a bit of research showing that excess gas production um, doesn't really correlate with the symptoms. So let's look at some of the research here. Uh, this is a recent review article, Management of Chronic Abdominal Distension and Bloating. And the statement here that I wanted to highlight is, most patients believe that their symptoms are due to an increased amount of gas within the gastrointestinal tract although this accounts for symptoms in only a minority of patients. And we'll see some additional evidence there, but I think a lot of practitioners might find this pretty surprising because that's sort of a general assumption that gas is often thought to be the 
primary cause of bloating and distension. I get a lot of evidence suggests that that's not necessarily the case. This is another review article from a while back, Abdominal Bloating, Pathophysiology and Treatment, and they're summarizing some of the evidence here. Uh, as of that time, they say the vast majority of studies do not support that excessive gas induces bloating or abdominal pain. Uh, they mentioned one particular study, Lasser et al. conducted a study using argon washout technique, which demonstrated no differences uh, in the accumulation of intestinal gas between patients with bloating and healthy subjects. Uh, so this is a common theme that you'll see as we highlight a few additional studies here. A lot of these studies don't find that there's a difference between patients such as IBS patients and healthy controls in terms of the amount of intestinal gas, uh, regardless of how they measure it. Uh, but it's the symptoms that are different. So we'll talk about why that may be the case. Well, they go on to say more recent studies, including CT scans combined with modern imaging analysis software, have also shown that excess gas is not associated with abdominal bloating in most patients. So again, I think this is probably pretty surprising to a lot of practitioners, uh, but it is out there in the research. Uh, yet another study that's more recent from just last year, visible abdominal distension and functional GI disorders, objective evaluation. I just want to highlight this here. They say abdominal distension is commonly attributed to excess intestinal gas by patients and their attending physicians. This belief is reinforced by the fact that visible distension is usually associated with other symptoms seemingly related to gas, such as bloating. However, our study showed that visible distension, so they're talking in this case more about distension, visible distension in our patients was associated with an increase in gas in only a minority of patients, so only about 5%, 5 out of 104. And so definitely a lot of accumulating evidence over the years <clears throat> when they actually look to see are there differences in gas production between uh, patients, usually patients with functional GI disorders, uh, and then symptoms. Uh, they find that basically both populations, the controls and the patients have similar amounts of gas, but again, only the patients uh, with IBS and other functional GI conditions have the symptoms. Uh, this is the last of these that I wanted to highlight here specifically related to this. Um, so you can see here the titles, colon hypersensitivity to distension rather than excessive gas production produces carbohydrate related symptoms in individuals with IBS. So a couple more quotes here. Um, so fructose increased small bowel water content in both patients. So not gas, but water, and that's due to an osmotic effect. And we'll see a little bit more about that in a moment. Fructose and inulin increase breath hydrogen levels in both groups compared with glucose. Controls had lower symptom scores. So these are the healthy controls uh, that had the same amounts of gas uh, based on breath hydrogen. They had lower symptom scores during the period after consuming the drink than patients with IBS. Despite the fact that they had similar MRI parameters, uh, basically the imaging results and also breath hydrogen responses. So both ways of detecting excess gas controls and patients were essentially the same in terms of their overall gas production. Uh, but again, only the patients had symptoms, not the controls. In patients with a response to inulin, symptoms related to the intraluminal gas, uh, but peak gas levels did not differ significantly between the responders, non-responders, or the healthy controls. So this is really kind of the key conclusion here. And this is what we're going to focus on for the rest, a big part of the rest of the webinar is this hypersensitivity. So they say this indicates that colonic hypersensitivity to distension rather than the excessive gas production itself produces carbohydrate-related symptoms in patients with IBS. There's been a lot of research on what are the causes of hypersensitivity, and then, of course, ultimately, what patients and practitioners can do about that. And this is just kind of a summary here that uh, looking across, as they say here, several different cohorts, in this case, five different cohorts, um, they generally found that patients um, had increased uh, visceral hypersensitivity that correlated with symptom severity. Uh, so there's, again, this large amount of evidence that visceral hypersensitivity is really kind of the key here and the differentiator between patients with functional GI conditions and controls. Uh, this is back to our review article on the misconceptions and then the current knowledge. Uh, so this is actually a really interesting table from that uh, particular review article. Um, so they're summarizing 
kind of the two key aspects that lead to the symptoms of bloating and distension. So in that first part, um, these are various factors that have been documented uh, that, we, that increase essentially the, the pressure or the, the distension uh, in the gut. Um, they term that as the bowel wall tension. I'll look at that in a moment. Um, but the other key part here in terms of producing symptoms uh, is you really need to have that augmented conscious perception, uh, which is also known as hypersensitivity. Um, so we'll talk about that again in depth here, but just wanted to go through a couple of the uh, key factors here. So that first one was gastric intestinal expansion. I swallowed air. That's the aerophagia that we talked about earlier. So that certainly can be one of the contributors, uh, particularly in patients that have a lot of belching. Uh, that's more of an upper GI phenomenon. Uh, expanded intestinal fluid load by osmotically active molecules. So by that, they mean particularly sugars, certain sugars uh, that have osmotic effects in the small intestine, uh, and also generally sort of small uh, carbohydrates. So oligosaccharides, lactulose, a lot of these can increase the water content uh, in the small intestine. And we'll uh, see another example there in just a moment. Um, also the accumulation of packed stool in patients that have constipation or slow transit. So that's uh, sort of intuitive, but we certainly know that, that can be a contributor as well to the overall contents of the gut, that that may exert some pressure on the, the walls of the intestine. Um, and then that can trigger in patients that have hypersensitivity, the symptoms. In patients that don't have hypersensitivity, uh, they may have a good tolerance to that level of whatever that's gas, fluid, or stool, and they may not experience symptoms. Uh, so again, there's gas as one of the possibilities, but it appears to be relatively minor in the overall picture. Um, there's also, in terms of what can contribute to this sort of hypersensitivity reaction, uh, intestinal wall inflammation, we'll be diving into that. Um, in terms of the functional GI conditions, that tends to be more of a low-grade type inflammation, often involving mast cells and sometimes eosinophils. A neurosensitization, and those two tend to go together. The immune system can activate uh, the nerve endings, the sensory nerves in the gut, uh, but that can also involve the rest of the nervous system. So there's some evidence that uh, even brain circuitry can be changed in IBS patients uh, so that they have an altered perception of symptoms. Um, certainly, we know that stress, anxiety, uh, things like that uh, play a role as well. Uh, but even evidence of circadian rhythm disruption, certain meal contents, like especially fatty meals, uh, et cetera, may all be contributors uh, both to um, increased bowel wall tension and also to this hypersensitivity phenomenon. Uh, so again, that's really what we want to focus on here today. So just to summarize really quick from all those studies, uh, basically the conclusion overall is that increases in intestinal gas, liquid and or solids after meals um, or just over time with in patients with constipation uh, when they have an increased stool burden. Uh, basically those parameters tend to be generally pretty similar if not the same between patients and uh, with functional GI conditions and then the healthy controls who don't have the symptoms. And that only the patients experience the actual uh, signs and symptoms, bloating and distension, again, to, to this visceral hypersensitivity. I uh, just wanna to touch on this one really briefly. So one of the other common sort of misconceptions, I think, is that bloating and distension primarily occur in the small intestine. Uh, that's probably because there's so much focus these days around the condition of SIBO. Um, I think a lot of practitioners, especially the ones that I've interacted with, um, in terms of just doing uh, consultations, reviewing stool test results, for example, um, they'll often describe bloating and, and distension as, quote, SIBO symptoms. Uh, so I like to uh, kind of review with them that there can be some additional causes that may be re relevant for their particular patient. And that differential diagnosis table that I showed earlier can actually be quite helpful as a reference uh, for these other potential causes. Uh, so just briefly, going back to this review, article they mentioned here, uh, basically the bottom of the quote, that patients that have uh, bloating tend to have that bloating occur pretty much anywhere in the abdomen. Uh, so it can be epigastric, it can be mid, lower, throughout, uh, which is one possible indicator that it can be in different parts of the GI tract. Uh, this one that we just reviewed a little bit ago uh, emphasizes that, and it's kind of representative of a lot of these studies that show that uh, certainly we know that uh, hypersensitivity in the colon and the colon's involvement in bloating and distension are well established at this point. 
Uh, so we know that that can happen in the lower GI tract. Um, and then back to our differential diagnosis table, just wanted to note a couple here. Uh, we also know that uh, in the stomach itself, whether it's gastroparesis, whether it's H. pylori infection or functional dyspepsia, uh, that bloating and distension may also originate higher up in the GI tract. So important to think about that it's not always a small intestine. There can be other parts of the GI tract where the problem is mainly originating from. This is a great review article. Uh, I believe it's available open access. Uh, so I would encourage uh, listeners to check this out if you get a chance. Uh, you can download it for free off of PubMed. Title here is Mechanisms Underlying Food Triggered Symptoms in Disorders of Gut-Brain Interactions. I just want to highlight another one of the quotes here. So they talk about that this was uh, viewed as a landmark discovery that mast cells are activated in the colon and the small bowel. So again, this is really indicating that it's not just one location. For many patients, it can be throughout their GI tract. Um, but basically, when the mast cells in, uh, are activated in the colon, the small bowel, uh, IBS patients, they tend to be closely associated with the intestinal nerves and their mediators, particularly histamine and proteases, and that their activation causes visceral hypersensitivity. So this is really where the level of the research is these days is that we know some of the specifics uh, that may be contributing to this hypersensitivity phenomenon that produces symptoms of bloating uh, and also the sign of distension in some patients. All right, so that takes me to this last category here that I wanna focus on, which are some of the research advances uh, relating to particularly microbes that are involved uh, in this hypersensitivity phenomenon and just more generally some of the details of what we know now from research studies. This is another great review article. Again, I would encourage you to access this. This is another open access article. Uh, it's in one of the top journals. Uh, so in the gastroenterology field, generally the two top uh, recognized journals are this one called Gut, and the other one is uh, Gastroenterology. And you'll note that there are a few of the key reviews and studies from that journal as well included here. So these are uh, I really wanted to point that out because these are really well um, established uh, phenomena um, that basically are thought to have su sufficient evidence that they are published in the top gastroenterology journals. Uh, so this is a review article of what's known to date uh, regarding these neuroimmune interactions and how they pertain to symptoms uh, in IBS and other uh, functional GI disorders. Uh, so they talk about here about these initial observations, and that's going back 20, 25 years where they started noticing that uh, there's an increase in mast cells and sometimes eosinophils in the gut uh, in IBS patients. Uh, they may mention that uh, these mast cells, when they're activated, can release nociceptive mediators or pain mediators, uh, and that that can also then sensitize neurons leading to this visceral hypersensitivity. So that's one of the key take-homes from this review article is that's uh, considered at this point pretty well established based on the extensive research on that. They also talk about how the interaction between uh, immune activation and also the impaired barrier function. So we haven't really talked about leaky gut. That's a common feature of many of these functional GI conditions, including IBS. Uh, so those two together are often present in patients and probably play a role together uh, in terms of the symptoms. Uh, so also important to consider assessing the intestinal barrier through markers such as zonulin. Uh, so they mentioned that uh, this interaction between the immune system and the barrier uh, is most likely bidirectional uh, with alterations in the microbiota, psychological stress, and also food components. So that's kind of a reminder to take those into account when you're assessing patients with these symptoms. We do want to assess the microbiome and understand how that can be related. Also levels of stress, stress can certainly cause leaky gut. Stress is even known to activate mast cells. So I really like this figure. Uh, this is from that same review article. Again, you can see the reference here at the top. Uh, so this is kind of a nice, simple visual summary, kind of a, what's at the core of this sort of phenomenon of visceral hypersensitivity. So mast cells can be activated by a variety of things. We'll actually see that in the next slide. They can release histamine, serotonin, tryptase and other uh, mediators that can then activate the neurons, the sensory neurons in the gut. You can see that uh, described below in the caption. But also in turn, the nerves 
potentially influence and activate the mast cells. So again, it's a bi-directional communication. Um, and that's thought to be one of the ways in terms of the nerve to the mast cell uh, direction for how stress may activate mast cells as well. Uh, this is another great figure. Uh, you can see the reference at the bottom here. So it summarizes several key aspects of mast cells and their uh, what are thought to be their key roles in functional GI conditions, again, such as IBS. You can see here at the top left, these are common triggers of mast cells, uh, including neurotransmitters. We just saw that there's that uh, nerve two mast cell connection. So that's where the neurotransmitters come into play. Certainly stress, food components, particularly food antigens. So patients may have uh, certain sensitivities to certain foods that can trigger mast cells. Um, wide range of bacterial products, we'll look at some of those, and also immune factors as well. All right, so that leads to then when mast cells are sufficiently triggered, then they can release all these various mediators, including various proteases. Those have been implicated in abdominal uh, sensitivity, hypersensitivity and pain, histamine, serotonin, and on. But I also want to kind of focus on this here so we know that that's uh, one of the key players in visceral hypersensitivity, uh, but also many of the other symptoms that are common, particularly to IBS and then other possibly other functional GI conditions. So there can be altered motility as a consequence of mast cell activation, uh, certainly increased leaky gut, and then further immune activation. So this can become a vicious cycle over time. Uh, this is a great example here of uh, some, how some of this research is now being kind of parsed out to specific foods. Uh, so in this case, you can see the title is relating these mast cell nerve interactions with the symptoms of bloating and abdominal pain in patients specifically with non-celiac gluten and wheat sensitivity. Uh, so they found that in this group that the mast cell density proportion of mast cells that are uh, closer to the nerve endings was significantly correlated with the severity of bloating and abdominal pain uh, they just know that this is also seen in functional GI conditions. So even food sensitivities, when patients have these conditions or these symptoms, or particularly bloating, again, there's evidence that mast cells are probably a key part of that process. Uh, back to one of these review articles, mechanisms underlying food triggers, food triggered symptoms in these functional GI disorders. Um, here they're talking about the diet microbiota interactions are also a critical source of neuroactive mediators. Uh, so the idea being that mast cells, when they're activated, are a source of mediators that can affect the nerves, uh, but also the microbes and how they're affected by the diet uh, in terms of what they produce, um, those can also be neuroactive mediators. And you can see several here listed towards the bottom, including histamine, proteases, and a few others, including serotonin. Uh, and then also LPS, so that's a, an important one to pay attention to. That's characteristic of many of these opportunistic organisms, especially the inflammatory microbes. Uh, we have many of those on GM map. Uh, so this may be one of the ways in which they're contributing uh, to these symptoms in functional GI conditions. Uh, this is actually a study that looked at specifically uh, in terms of FODMAPs. What, what is the interaction between FODMAPs, the symptoms, and also the microbiome? Uh, they found that the low FODMAP diet improves the barrier function in the colon and also reduces mast cell activation while decreasing the fecal LPS levels. So that's a really an interesting observation that's been repeated in a number of studies and kind of fits into this overall um, scenario. We know that there are receptors on the mast cells for this LPS. So that is one of the factors that can trigger them. Um, and they also mentioned that the, the flip side is that the high FODMAP diet uh, causes mast cell activation, uh, partly by increasing the availability of LPS. We'll see a really nice figure of that in a little bit, um, but that seems to be one of the better established connections here in terms of how uh, FODMAPs may actually trigger symptoms. So of course, uh, it may be multifactorial, but we certainly know that FODMAPs can lead to increased uh, gas production. Uh, there's lots of evidence that in the small intestine, they can lead to increased fluid uh, due to the osmotic effect of some of the FODMAPs. Um, so FODMAPs may contribute to symptoms in several ways. And part of this is through uh, influencing the microbiome. So this is the figure I was referring to. 
So I think this is probably one of the, the best figures I've seen out there that shows how far we've come in these uh, specifics in terms of what kind of going all the way from the dietary component through to specific microbes and then on to the specifics uh, in terms of the interactions between the immune system and the nervous system. So you can see here that uh, it's been established in several studies that one of the things that FODMAPs do are promote some of these opportunistic microbes, such as Klebsiella species. Um, Klebsiella are LPS producers, uh, but they're also known to produce histamine. So you can see here they're depicting how uh, when they're growing on FODMAPs, so Klebsiella in general do well on a variety of carbohydrates, including FODMAPs. That promotes this conversion of histidine to histamine which then can bind to certain histamine receptors on the mast cells, triggering them to produce mediators, including histamine. Um, and then they can also produce uh, things like uh, tryptase and serotonin, et cetera. They can also have effects on the nerves. Uh, so this is actually a list of microbes from this review article that are known to stimulate mast cells in various ways. Um, different microbes tend to produce different factors. Some of them are LPS producing, some are histamine producing. Uh, Staph aureus <clears throat> produces something called superantigens, which may be one of the factors that uh, stimulates the immune response. That's one of the ones we commonly see in patients that have these symptoms. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, also well known, uh, particularly as a resident of the upper GI tract, uh, where it's been documented to promote food reactions, uh, can cause some inflammation in the upper GI tract, also known to be one of the microbes related to IBS and also can stimulate mast cells. So again, we see those probably, those would be sort of the top two that, that we tend to see uh, related to food reactions and these uh, common types of symptoms. Uh, strep, elevated strep is pretty common. Uh, some of the Enterococcus species. Candida actually is well-documented as a potential mast cell activating microbe. H. pylori, as we talked about earlier. Uh, various LPS producers, so E. coli, Klebsiella, Citrobacter, et cetera. Uh, and many of those also can produce other factors like histamine that can cause issues. Uh, so definitely these opportunists uh, tend to be very commonly implicated uh, in these types of reactions. Uh, a little bit more detail about them that they actually, as you can see here in this review article, are referred to as partners in crime with Pseudomonas. So they have a nice visual summary here of how they can often co-occur in biofilms. And again, these are more upper GI type microbes uh, for example, Pseudomonas aeruginosa has been confirmed in several studies to primarily inhabit the stomach and small intestine. Uh, tends to not be active at all in the colon. So with Pseudomonas, uh, some of the ones that are on GI map, I just want to highlight here, Streptococcus, Enterococcus, Staph, and Candida, uh, can all be together, found together in biofilms. So you can imagine that when you see them all together on a GI map, uh, overgrown in patients that have these symptoms, uh, they could essentially be part of a community that together is contributing to the symptoms. A um, little bit of kind of a consideration of upstream, what may cause this type of overgrowth. Uh, this is a summary of uh, kind of a, a meta-analysis of uh, studies that were looking at the effects of proton pump inhibitors and how they affect the microbiome. Uh, so out of this, there's so many studies that have been done that, that they were able to select 19 that met their criteria. Uh, consistently found elevation in these different microbes, which are basically the same ones we just saw uh, that can coexist in biofilms, that can also activate mast cells. So that may be one of the upstream contributors when patients are not digesting well, that they have low stomach acid, uh, you may be more likely to see these elevated uh, in stool test results. Uh, test, uh, uh, the title here pretty much summarizes uh, the point is that intestinal fungal dysbiosis, primarily candida, is associated with visceral hypersensitivity in patients with IBS, so that can be another contributor. Uh, just a quick kind of summary of some of the research that's out there on how candida uh, has been established as one of the microbes that can activate mast cells. All right, so let's talk a little bit about testing and treatment implications based on all that research. So again, when it comes to assessment, uh, really you can get a lot of great relevant information from comprehensive stool testing uh, in terms of all these various microbes that have been implicated in the pathophysiology related, particularly to bloating and to some extent distension, uh, and then also the related physiological imbalances, uh, particularly digestion and immune activation.
So we talked a little bit about H. pylori now that we've kind of gone through this list. We know H. pylori can reduce stomach acid. So that may be kind of one of the upstream contributors to these downstream microbes being overgrown. H. pylori itself, uh, we know, can cause gastritis. So it can cause inflammation, upper GI tract. Um, so we know that there's various ways in which that can be implicated, including uh, activating mast cells. So in terms of the opportunistic microbes, again, we saw a lot of these uh, in terms of uh, potential uh, microbes that can activate mast cells. There's the Enterococcus fecalis in this case, Pseudomonas. Uh, Morganella is another well-known histamine producer, also an LPS producer. So that's something we commonly see elevated in patients that have these types of symptoms. Again, staph and strep. So just highlighting those here, uh, since we do commonly see them in patients with these symptoms. And now that you we've gone through this information, you should be able to understand a little bit more about how they may be related to those symptoms. Then we have the inflammatory section. So these are largely the LPS producers um, that can contribute to inflammation through LPS. Again, in some cases through uh, histamine production. Um, as far as histamine producers, several Klebsiella species have been implicated, uh, particularly Klebsiella pneumoniae and also uh, Klebsiella aerogenii. So those are highlighted here. Um, Candida, also, we just talked about that, so we know that, that can be one of the common microbes implicated. Uh, in terms of intestinal health markers, uh, so I want to focus a little bit on this digestion aspect. <clears throat> Last days tends to be deficient in a lot of patients with these symptoms, uh, but that can also be related to other digestive uh, insufficiencies. So when you're considering digestive dysfunction, it's important to consider hypochlorhydria. There are no direct markers on GMAP, <coughs> excuse me, for hypochlorhydria, um, but that is one that we often will see a signature of, either through H. pylori, which can decrease stomach acid, uh, or the overgrowth pattern that we talked about that may be related to that. <clears throat> There's also the pancreatic enzyme uh, deficiency that we just talked about, bile acid insufficiency, small intestinal brush border enzyme deficiency, so that's something that we commonly suspect in patients that have carbohydrate malabsorption, carbohydrate intolerance, and sometimes a small intestinal dysbiosis. All right, so let's look at a couple other markers here. So antigliadin, <clears throat> again, that can be a sign of um, particularly gluten reactivity. And we just saw earlier that for some patients can involve mast cell activation, which may be one of the contributors to bloating in patients with gluten reactivity. Also eosinophil activation protein. <clears throat> so we know there's a lot of uh, evidence that eosinophil activation protein uh, is something that can damage the intestinal barrier. Uh, we know that that tends to be produced, of course, by eosinophils that are activated. And there's kind of this mutual interaction between mast cells and eosinophils in terms of activating each other. So it's quite possible when you see that elevated that patients may also have mast cell activation in some cases. Let's talk a little bit more about kind of general treatment strategy here in the last few minutes. <clears throat> in terms of adverse food reactions, we certainly know that um, those have commonly been broken down into the immune-mediated and then also the non-immune-mediated, which are uh, kind of generally thought of as food intolerances. Um, so and traditionally, this has been viewed in terms of food allergies, <clears throat> food sensitivities, uh, celiac disease on the immune side, carbohydrate intolerance, uh, histamine intolerance on the uh, food intolerance side. Um, but it turns out that in IBS and other functional GI conditions, <clears throat> these may also be triggers of symptoms. So there's definitely some overlap between uh, the general food reaction categories and then how they may be involved in triggering IBS type symptoms. So it's important to really think about the different types of foods that patients may be reacting to. <clears throat> uh, whether they have an immune-mediated type reaction that may be more like a food sensitivity or whether they have something related to more on the intolerance side. So I want to talk a little bit here really quickly about <clears throat> some of the evidence behind some of these um, natural factors that may help to reduce mast cell activation uh, and also address some of the microbes that could be activating the mast cells. Uh, so this here is a recent review article. It says, effects of dietary components on mast cells, possible use as nutraceuticals 
for allergies, but they're addressing mast cells. So uh, these also could apply in the context of uh, functional GI conditions. And many of them have already been explored in that context. So you can see here that under lipids, uh, butyrate is certainly one of the things that's been well studied, but other types of fatty acids may help to uh, inhibit mast cells. In terms of vitamins, vitamin D is probably by far the best studied. <clears throat> there are certain amino acids that may also apply. Um, generally, phenolic compounds or polyphenols, we know that they have general anti-inflammatory functions, uh, so those are often something to consider. Um, there's especially interesting research on cinnamon extract, which I'll talk about here a little bit more in a moment, um, and also carotenoids. There's some evidence there as well. So a variety of different food components, uh, nutrition components, uh, may have um, effects in helping to reduce mast cell activation. Uh, so cinnamon in this particular extract from cinnamon, uh, cinnamaldehyde, uh, it's been well studied in terms of potential inhi potentially inhibiting uh, the quorum sensing part of bacterial communication that's essential for biofilm formation. So you can see here, just based on the title, um, that there is some established activity, particularly against biofilms formed by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, so it's important to consider that uh, these various spices, for example, uh, polyphenols may have inhibitory effects on biofilms, and that can be another way to address the microbes that are uh, contributing to mast cell activation. Uh, just another review article here, I just wanna highlight this figure. Uh, it's kind of a complicated figure, so I'm gonna zoom in on a couple of factors here. They're just highlighting some of the nutraceuticals that are known to, particularly for specific mechanisms, <clears throat> to be able to potentially inhibit mast cells. So lipoic acid, NAC, taurine, and biotin all have some evidence that they may uh, help with uh, mast cell activation. Also berberine, uh, and then they mention H2S, that's hydrogen sulfide. So there are a number of different um, uh, nutraceuticals. Uh, NAC is actually one, garlic extract would be another. Um, so those types of compounds, sulforaphane, that we think of as uh, being sulfur containing, um, in the body, physiologically, um, they can participate in reactions that create hydrogen sulfide, uh, which at normal physiological levels uh, evidence suggests that it may help to inhibit some immune reactions, such as mast cells. Uh, resveratrol is another that has been implicated in reducing mast cell activation, just another example. Um, actually, surprisingly, there's, there's some information on apple cider vinegar. Uh, kind of makes sense in the context of, uh, we know that many of these types of microbes, E. coli, staph, and candida, may be elevated in patients that have insufficient stomach acid. Uh, so this may be one way to help um, re uh, reduce those microbes based on a pH effect. Uh, lastly, various lactic acid bacteria. So that would be, in terms of probiotics, primarily lactobacillus. Uh, that's a producer of lactic acid. Uh, there are quite a few studies out there uh, with particular lactobacillus probiotics uh, showing that they can have an especially important effect in that upper GI tract. Uh, may inhibit these common microbes that we know are implicated, such as staph, and also pseudomonas. Uh, so lots of different ways in which we can potentially shift the balance in the gastrointestinal tract uh, towards um, a scenario where, where the immune cells, the mast cells may be less activated, uh, leading to reduced symptoms in patients. All right, so a quick summary here of what we've talked about today. Uh, so we know that visceral hypersensitivity is a major contributor to abdominal bloating and also potentially to distension especially in functional GI disorders. Uh, we know that that involves increase in neuroimmune interactions, particularly those involving mast cells, and that can be triggered by certain foods as well as microbial products. Uh, and all of that together can contribute to this increased hypersensitivity. And then hopefully you uh, have seen through, walking through the GI map results, there are quite a few of the markers on GI map they can help provide great clinical insights into what may be going on in patients with these common symptoms. And that gives you specific targets to address in your therapeutic uh, program. All right, so thank you so much for listening today. I'm ready to take any questions if we have time. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Fabian. And I think we can squeeze in some Q&A. What does zo elevated zonulin indicate? Uh, elevated zonulin, so that's one of the markers that can be added on to GI map, and that's well established as a marker when it's elevated for increased intestinal permeability. 
so that's one of the ways to assess the intestinal barrier. It's probably the best study uh, in terms of leaky gut. Um, and we know that there's just a really strong connection between leaky gut and symptoms like bloating. Um, so that, that to me would be a very important marker to assess. Thank you. Um, and what are the most common reasons for low SIG-A and what are the best tre treatments? That's another great question. So by far the most common cause of low secretory IgA is lack of commensal bacteria. Um, that can be across the board and overall deficiency, or it can be very specific. Sometimes we just see, for example, low acromancia. Uh, generally, we you know from lots of research that the products they produce, like butyrate, help to stimulate secretory IgA production, uh, which is probably why, when they're deficient, that we see lower secretory IgA. And in some cases, it may also be due to patients that just have reduced immune function overall. Uh, but in the research, it's pretty clear that lack of certain commensals, especially butyrate producers and also acromancia, uh, tend to be connected to low secretory IgA. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Um, do you have an initial go-to test to help with directing next steps? Uh, that's a great question. So, of course, if you've looked at uh, GM map in a patient that has, uh, say, IBS with a lot of bloating, distension, <clears throat> um, you should be able to identify some key markers there. Again, often we'll see organisms like H. pylori, increased commensals in many of the, the patients. Um, an overgrowth pattern is pretty common. Um, for, for the IBS-D variety, um, you're actually going to be more likely to see a lack of commensals, especially butyrate producers. Um, a common signers, signature is also increase in Escherichia. Um, you'll often see reduced digestion markers. Um, so that already gives you quite a bit to follow up on with most patients. Uh, we do see that when those are addressed, that those symptoms tend to be reduced. Uh, but beyond that, you know, for example, we do see that patients will have a lot of food reactions and it can be important to identify those specific foods. So whether that's an elimination diet um, or a practitioner may want to follow up with a food sensitivity type test to try to identify additional foods that the patient may be reacting to. Uh, so those would probably be, you know, definitely with GIMAP itself, there's, there's a lot of results right there to follow up on. Um, but you know, there, there are other tests that if you kind of uh, find that the patient's not responding well um, or that you just want to identify something additional. A lot, of, a lot of practitioners will also run an organic acids test, for example, um, just to kind of get more of a general idea of the patient's metabolism. Um, so it's going to depend on each patient in terms of what sorts of testing may make sense. But those are common scenarios. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you again, Dr. Fabian, for a great presentation today. And thank you to all of our attendees for taking the time out of your busy days to join us. This webinar was brought to you by integrativepractitioner.com and sponsored by Diagnostic Solutions Laboratory. Thank you all and have a great day.